Mr. Allen. Well, of all people, Portland. <laughs> is always reviving old plays. That's true. Don't they ever revive old radio programs? The only one who listens to our program is Edgar Bergen. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy bring you The Chase and Sanborn 101st Anniversary Show presents Fred Allen. I can thank only one person for this job, Charlie McCarthy. Starring Fred Allen and Fred's guests, Tallulah Bankhead, Jack Benny, Milton Berle, Shirley Booth as Donnie Mahoney, Major Bowes, Bing Crosby, Leo DeRosha, Maurice Evans, Portland Hoffa, Georgie Jessel, Bert Lahr, Oscar Levant, Beatrice Lilly, Minerva Pius as Mrs. Nussbaum, Parker Fenley as Titus Moody, Peter Donald as Ajax Cassidy, Alan Reed as Falstaff Openshaw, and when I'm not blowing the claghorn, Senator that is, my name is Kenny Delmar. And here with Fred Allen are Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Well, Fred, we've enjoyed laughing at you so much over the radio. And now it's a pleasure to laugh in your face. <laughs> Well, this summer, Edgar, I spent quite a lot of time with my genealogist. Having trouble with your genie? No, no, John. <laughs> no. Well, it may interest you to know, Mr. Charles McCarthy, that you and I are cousins. Mr. Allen, this is blackmail. No, no. <laughs> and I am just as much ashamed of it as you are. Yeah, well, now, how do you explain that, Fred? Well, as you know, Edgar, my name is Sullivan. Yes. And my genealogist traced the Sullivans back to their lineal origin in Ireland, you see? If you're Irish, you must be shanty Irish. Well, that's better than being a part of the shanty. <laughs> and I learned that my great-great-grandfather, Seamus Sullivan III, had five children. Oh, I see. Michael, Patrick, Timothy, Shaughnessy, and Jaime. Michael, the eldest, while in Dublin, met Molly McCarthy. You see, Charles, the records prove that you were a Sullivan on your mother's side yeah. and a shillelagh on your father's side. Now, where do I come in now? Well, your great-grandfather was named Pine McCarthy. His son was a cone. <laughs> and as I am your closest living relative, I feel that it is my bounden duty... To look after you, Cousin Charles. Now, just a moment, Fred. You can't take Charlie away from me. Now, we can't forget old Chase and Alexander. But <laughs> after all, Edgar, blood is thicker than coffee. So Fred and Charlie took off together for Allen's Alley. The senator's home. I'll knock and see what happens. Somebody, I say, somebody knock. Yes, I know. Claghorn's the name, Senator Claghorn, I know, is. you're from the South. When yes. I'm in New York, I'll never go to the Yankee Stadium. Now, wait a minute. I won't even go to see the Giants unless a South Falls pitcher. Well, look, wait a minute. I refuse to watch the Dodgers unless Dixie Walker's playing. Now, wait a minute. Stop me... interrupting. Where's your manners? Manners, I have more... Hey, try listening. You might learn something. Listen, all I'll ever learn... Your tongue's wagging like a blind dog's tail in a meat market. <laughs> You're winded, hey? <laughs> Just sucking in some air, son. <laughs> well, leave a little. I'm breathing, too, you know. <laughs> tell me, uh, tell me, Senator, what is Washington doing about cold prevention? The Senate, I say, the Senate reconvened just in time. Yeah? Okay. I was glad to see Senator Aiken back. <laughs> Aching back, that's a joke. Son. I know it's a joke. I know. That was a swanny side split. I, I wouldn't have guessed. That was a Shreveport shrieker. Listen, you don't know what it is. I keep step. tossing them and you just sidestep them. Well, look at them. Now, wait. Say, you're a regular sad sack. Sack, that is. Now, you wait. <laughs> Tell me, uh, cool off now just a second. Do you have a favorite cure for a cold? I caught a cold last week. Yeah. I'd like to ruin my filibuster. Ruin your filibuster? <laughs> What did you do? I took an old southern remedy, son. I drank down two buckets of hot mint julep. You drank two buckets of hot mint juleps and you still held the floor? Held the floor? Son, I couldn't get up off it. <laughs> well, I wonder how Titus Moody is doing this evening. 
Howdy, Bob. <laughs> Say, uh, Mr. Moody, you look a little tired. I know. I was up all night. Couldn't get a wink. You didn't sleep a wink? No, no, it wasn't that. Somebody stole my tiddly. Uh... <laughs> well, look. well, Mr. Moody, uh, tell me, has this cold epidemic hit your farm? My wife had a nasty cold. Did you call the doctor? Yeah. Go down quick, give her sulfur and molasses. Put in too much sulfur. Well, how can you tell he gave her too much sulfur? When my wife sets in the dark, she glows. <laughs> well, are you doing anything about it? Why, Senator Claghorn, a foreigner next door... <laughs> he sent me over a bucket of hot mint julep. For your wife? No, no, for me. Tonight I'm getting lit up to keep her company. So long, Doctor. Oh, well, Looks as old Titus is going to get lit up on his weekend. Well, let's see what a knock here will start. No. Ah, oh, Mrs. Nussbaum. You are expecting maybe two la lu la lu la banquet? No. <laughs> Tell me, Mrs. Ann, have you had any colds in your house? My husband, Pierre, is sick. Oh, really? They are maybe sending him to a clinic, the Meyer Brothers. Oh, the Meyer Brothers. <laughs> well, didn't Pierre try any cold remedies? Every day is a new remedy. First, he is bringing home fruit to drinking fruit juices. What kind? Oranges, grapefruits, tambourines. <laughs> well, how long did he drink the fruit juices? One day. Mm -hmm. Then Pierre is opening up the window and throwing out the fruit. Oh, he had another remedy? Vitamins from vegetables. Oh, good. good. <laughs> He's bringing home carrots, sprinkler beans, and rutabagos. <laughs> How long did he try vitamins? One day. One day again. Pierre is opening up the window and throwing out the vegetables. He had yet another remedy? Absolute rest. Oh. You're staying in bed. Uh huh. I am bringing meals. I'm bringing pills. I'm bringing hot water bottles. Well, how long did this last? One day. And then? I am opening up the window and throwing out Pierre. <laughs> well, here we are at the last shack in Allen's Alley. Let's see what happens here. Roses are red, jonquils are yellow, <laughs> Falstaff is here, and the stuff is mellow. Oh. Uh... You have been sweating out new cantos? Oh, indubitably. Tonight, we are simply discussing the common cold and its prevention. Precisely why I am here. Yes? I have rolled a rondo. Attention, you men of science. Oh, I know you've harnessed the atom. Jet propulsion you mastered last June. Radar you've reduced to a plaything. And now you're in touch with the moon. But one small microbe defies you. And science is 10,000 years old. You haven't subdued Coriza. The germ of the common cold. So attention, you men of science. Until this germ you confront right, half of this country will be sneezing and the other half saying Gesundheit. Fred Allen made fun of everything. Yeah, you should have heard what he said about you, Bergen. <laughs> His satire of an early morning husband and wife radio show is immortal. Complete with Canary and Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> Good morning, Freddy, darling. Good morning, Tulu Angel. Sweetheart, I must say you look refreshingly well rested this morning. Yes, thanks to our wonderful Pasternak factory tested Pussy Willow mattress. <laughs> the mattress that takes all of the guesswork out of sleeping. <laughs> so soft. Only the hearts of the tender Pussy Willows are you. <laughs> well. Breakfast ready, Angel Face? Yes, sweetums. Here's your coffee. Well, thank you, doll. Ah. Uh... Oh, Peach Fuzz. You've spilled some on your vest. Good. Now I can try some of that little panther spot remover. <laughs> no harsh rubbing. Just spray some little panther on your vest and watch it eat the spot right out. <laughs> and imagine, darling. Stop! Don't you dare move to Lou. darling. What? What have you done to your hair? That sheen, that brilliance. Well, I guess it's what so many society women are doing these days. I went to Madame Yvonne's hair do heaven. It's on Madison Avenue. You go to the back of the orange juice stand. <laughs> Rap three times and ask for Antoine. Well, it is divine. Your head looks like the back of a bunny, really. <laughs> well, 
do you know, darling, that Madame Yvonne, Madame Yvonne uses a sensational hairdressing. Really? It contains that new mystery ingredient, chicken fat. <laughs> Oh, our canary. Oh, little Yasha is so happy, so carefree, and why shouldn't he be happy? Yes, he knows that the newspaper on the bottom of his cage is New York's leading daily. <laughs> morning, oh, good morning, mums and daddies. Oh, oh isn't she cute? <laughs> I just love the way your tooth is shining this morning. <laughs> Yes, Mummy. I brushed it with Dr. Pratt's homogenized toothpaste. So sweet. I love you, Mummy oh. and Dad. I love you, too, Dad. Now you run along to school, baby. <laughs> well, that's little Yasha telling us our time is up. We'll be back tomorrow morning at 6, folks. Until then, this is Freddie. And to Lou. Saying goodbye. goodbye. <laughs> now, wasn't that... Wasn't that simple, Tallulah, with a radio program like this? But it's ridiculous, Fred. Nobody can possibly be that cheerful every morning. Well, that's true. If one of those happy couples woke up grouchy one morning, the listener would probably hear something like this. Uh, 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 hey, uh, knucklehead, get out of that bed. you got a program to do. Will you quit yapping? <laughs> Six o'clock in the morning. Who's up to listen to us? A couple of burglars and Arthur Godfrey, maybe. <laughs> Mouth tastes like a sand hog Just pulled his foot out of it Dad, I'm sleeping Well, why don't you stay home some night and try sleeping? Sleeping on that Pasternak Pussy Willow mattress? Pussy Willow It's stuffed with cat hair Every time I lie down on that cat hair My back arches Oh, stop beefing Here's your coffee Well, it's about time I spill some on my nightshirt Oh, you're such a slob I'll get that bottle <laughs> That little bottle of panther spot removal. You're not putting any of that Adam juice on me. <laughs> the last time it ate away my nightshirt and I still had the spot left. <laughs> Where do you find these sponsors? In the police lineup? Ah! <laughs> Your hair. <laughs> it, it looks as though you just took your head out of a mix master. I know that hag, Madam Yvonne, with her chicken fat. My hair keeps sliding off my head. <laughs> ah, that bird again. Shut up, you molting pest. Now look here, clam Oh, face. shut up. And Yasha, you shut up, too. Good morning, Mummy and Daddy. <laughs> That'll teach you sneaking up on your parents with that one tooth like an old elf. <laughs> Can the kid help it if she looks like you? <laughs> I will make that first. Go gum a donut. Hot down, Tom. And I've had enough of this grind with you and that kid in the canary yapping around. I've got a gun here. You're right, you kid, Yasha. Yes, and you're next. Ah! Daddy, you killed Mommy. Now it's your turn. Charlie, have you met Chase and Sanborn's star sales lady, Caroline O'Connor? Have we met? Kenny, what Charlie means is that we've worked together before. Why, Caroline, baby, I never considered it work selling Chase and Sanborn with you. Oh, thank you, Charlie. Now, when I was working with Bergen, way back when you were a little girl, I tell you... Oh, but you... Charlie, it's all different today. Oh, sure, Charlie. Now there's a great new instant Chase and Sanborn coffee. <laughs> Caroline, do we need this part-time southerner? Now, now, Charlie, everybody's excited about our new heftier instant coffee. It's made from a new heftier blend of the world's finest coffee beans. Is there an echo in here? <laughs> that means new instant Chase and Sanborn has extra flavor, extra aroma... And extra satisfaction. <laughs> you know, come to think of it, working with Bergen wasn't so bad. <laughs> Fred Allen was a great fan of Bing Crosby's. When Bing's first book came out, Fred went to see him on business. This must be the Crosby suite. I just saw a horse go in the other door. <laughs> See, I wonder... Well, I'll knock. Uh, Look, bud, if you're a song plugger or something, I do all my business through Nick Kenny, the writer of Moon Over Mother's Day. <laughs> And if it's about baseball, the pirates have a bat boy, so just well, run look, no, they're yeah. trying to get Dorothy Lamour's telephone number. It'll cost you fifteen bucks. That's what Hope charged me. <laughs> well, Bing, you you remember me? I'm uh, Fred Allen. Oh, Fred. Yes. yes. Capital A. I didn't recognize yeah. you. I didn't recognize you, yeah. Fred. You look wonderful. I do. Well, the last time I saw you, you looked like a medical student's homework. <laughs> 
Well, I'll tell you why I'm here, Bing. I just finished reading that new book about your life. Bing, you and I can take this book and make a picture of it. It'll gross four million dollars. Oh, no, Fred, I'm... I'm too busy. Too busy to make four million dollars? Well, Fred, you can't take it with you, you know. Well, I know. But when Gabriel blows his horn, Bing, you can come back and look around for it. <laughs> Fred admired great actors like Maurice Evans. Oh, how I long for a voice like his. And how lucky you are, you've got a voice like mine. <laughs> well, as soon as Maurice Evans got out of the army, Fred called on him. Well, Maurice, now that you're out of the army, I guess you'll stay in the uh, Shakespeare racket, huh? Racket? Why, Shakespeare's writing was immortal. He'd be as great a writer today as he was 300 years ago. Why, he couldn't even write for radio, Maurice. Now, you be W. Shakespeare, and I'll show you what might happen if Shakespeare tried to get a job in radio today. The scene? A busy advertising agency. Hello, Bat and Foot, Rootroff, and Rubicam Advertising <laughs> Okay. Hey, you. You waiting to see somebody? Yes, Mr. Allen. What's your name? William Shakespeare. Address? <coughs> Stratford on the Bronx. <laughs> I'm a writer. Go right in. Thank you. Ah, oh, come right in. I am a busy man. Have a chair. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, what was on your mind, Mr. Uh, I didn't get your name. Shakespeare. William Shakespeare. I write plays. Well, I'll tell you, Shakespeare, I do need a cereal program. It's for a new product, a soap powder called Doesn't. <laughs> Doesn't is a new idea in soap powders. All the other soap powders do things. Doesn't, doesn't do a thing. <laughs> now, I need a good radio show to put this soap powder over. Well, I have a play called Hamlet. Hamlet? Sounds like a spam derivative. <laughs> what is the play about? The first scene is in the King's Castle in Denmark. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, no, no. Denmark is out. For a radio serial, it has to be a small town in the Middle West. Uh, let's say Centerville. The family is living in a Quonset hut. <laughs> now, who is in the family? Uh, Claudius, Hamlet, Polonius, Horatio, Gertrude, and Ophelia. Well, Ophelia isn't bad, but those other names are out, Shakespeare. Claudius, we'll call Papa Maya. <laughs> Hamlet will be Sam. <laughs> Polonius will be Lorenzo Fink. <laughs> There's also a ghost in the story. A ghost? Great. The ghost can do the commercials. I wash my sheet in dozens. <laughs> well, pick up the ball, Shakespeare. What happens in the story? Well, Hamlet's father is killed by his uncle who marries Hamlet's mother. Murder is out. Serial programs cannot have murder. Well, Ophelia goes insane. The king is poisoned. Well, the Hamlet story is too gruesome for radio. Throw this whole thing out. Get a new story. Know what I mean? Yes, sir. The town is Centerville. Good. Papa Mayer runs the local grocery store. Ophelia is in love with Sam. Fine. Lorenzo Fink tries to make trouble. Instead of Hamlet, I'll call my serial Ophelia Faces Life. <laughs> You've got yourself a deal, Shakespeare. Uh, what do you say? Oh. Shakespeare, put down that gun. Ah! Shakespeare, say something. To be or not to be, that is the question. Dad, what an idea. To be or not to be, the serial is out. I'll make the whole thing a quiz program. To be or not to be, for Fred often went to meet Georgie Jessel at Lindy's famous restaurant. Well, Fred, sit down. I was just going out to dinner. You can watch me. Oh, <laughs> But, uh, Georgie... Hey, waiter! Yes, sir? Waiter, I'd like a nice knish. Knish? What is a knish? Georgie, a waiter in Lindy's, and he doesn't know what a knish is? Well, he, he's new here, you oh, see. <laughs> well, perhaps you would better tell him what a knish is. Well, I will. Now, look, waiter, a knish is a little thing. It uh, looks like a half a ladyfinger, and it weighs 200 pounds. <laughs> Oh, trouble, trouble, trouble. I should have eaten on the train. Oh, you were on the train? Well, of course. I just got back from Washington. Ooh. I had an appointment with the president. The president? Uh-huh. Georgie, not the cabinet. <laughs> 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 Who knows? Marshall may be leaving. Anything can happen, Fred, you know. <laughs> but, Georgie, you... I can see the headlines now. UN endorses the Jessel plan. The Jessel plan? It'll be bigger than the Jolson story. <laughs> Fred once tried to get the great baseball player, Leo DeRocher, to sing opera. Then how come he never played on the Mets? Listen, 
I am the captain of the Dodger team And a right good captain to be I am quiet and subdued And they say a little crude But I frighten rather easily He is quiet and subdued And they say a little crude But he frightens rather easily Bad language and abuse I never, never use No one do I intentionally irk Though heavens I may Occasionally say I never call an umpire jerk <laughs> What never? No, never What never? Well, hardly ever He never calls an umpire jerk So give a cheer and give a shout for The Dungeon Captain with a big loud was great, great, Leo. If Rudy Valley is listening in, he'll never know another good night's sleep. <laughs> what happens next, Fred? Well, now, Leo, comes your big love scene. The game starts, and as you're standing in front of the dugout, something hits you on the ear. Someone, someone has thrown a rose. At Ebbets Field? <laughs> well, this is a fantasy, Leo. You look up, and there she stands, the beautiful mystery girl. She speaks. It was me that turned a rose, Leo. <laughs> Mystery girl, who are you? I'm sweet little Bobby Socks, dear little Bobby Socks, but I'm not getting younger, you see. Too long I have tarried, but since Frankie's married, it's lifting the rose for me. Leo. <laughs> Leo. Now it's the big climax, Leo. Get this picture. It's the last half of the ninth inning. Two men out. The crowd is going crazy. You step up to the plate. I'm the umpire behind the plate. We hear Red Barber over the loudspeaker saying... Leo is the Dodgers' only hope. There's the pitch. DeRosha swings. Yeah! It looks like a home run, ladies and gentlemen. Leo is rounding first base. He's around second, around third. He's heading for home. The ball is coming in. Leo's going to slide. You're out! Out! Why, you lardhead, I was safe a mile. Quiet, you. I'll knock you flatter than your singing voice. <laughs> yeah, you fat as mustache. Ah, you... <laughs> Your sister's sideburn. Ah, your grandmother's goatee. Ah, your aunt's Van Dyke. <laughs> I said you're out. The game is over. The Dodgers lose. Oh, yeah? I'll beat your brains out. Give me that bat. Halt! Cease! Little Bobby Sox. <laughs> you. Put down the bat, Lippy. But it's only Cockeye Allen, the umpire. Cockeye Allen's my old man. What's the meaning of this, Bobby Sox? Leo wants to marry me, Cockeye, don't you, Leo? Me marry an umpire's daughter? They'll throw me out of who's who. <laughs> With those glasses, how did you ever become an umpire? I'll tell you the whole sad story, Leo. When I was a lad, I could not see a hand held up in front of me. In spite of how I'd squint and peer, I couldn't tell my father from my mother, dear. My eyes were oh so very, very weak. But now I am an umpire in the National League. His eyes were oh so very, very weak. That's why he is an umpire in the National League. And then... Then there's a happy ending, Leo. I give you permission to marry my daughter, Bobby Sox, and the entire ensemble joins in the big finale. My lip I will button up When you say batter up Even though games you will rob I'll be ever discreet, so tender, so sweet, and soon I'll be out of a job. So give three cheers and one cheer more for, this concludes a broken pin. Number one, Alan's Alley. 
Somebody, I say, somebody's bang in my barricade. <laughs> Claghorn's name, Senator Claghorn, that is, and I haven't time to talk to you now. I'm having my coffee. Oh, you enjoy coffee, Senator? Offer it to me, ma'am, and I can't say no. You can't say no because it's chasing Sanborn coffee? Can't say no because N-O is the abbreviation for North. <laughs> Oh, Senator, our new heftier Chase and Sanborn, instant and roasted, is being discovered east, west, north, and south. Never heard of them other three places, but if it's in the south, I'm for it. That's wonderful, Senator, because our new heftier instant Chase and Sanborn is made in New Orleans. Ma'am, you don't have to tell that to a Louisiana Lollapalooza. Then you know our coffee is a new heftier blend of the world's richest coffee beans, heftier for extra flavor and aroma. That goes for Chase and Sanborn instant and roasted. Ma'am, I'll have you know Senator Claghorn's up on his two hind legs in the Senate every day, pushing the entire line. Chase and Sanborn. No, Mason and Dixon. <laughs> Pay attention, gal. The Chase and Sanborn 101st Anniversary Show presents Fred Allen will continue after a brief pause for station identification. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy continue with the second half of the Chase and Sanborn 101st Anniversary Show presents Fred Allen. And here's Edgar. When I lunched with Fred Allen and Bert Lahr, it was a duel. Fred's talk cut like a rapier. Bert's weapon was the slapstick. What did you use, Bergen? A damp noodle? <laughs> Fred once tried to put Bert Lahr on, like this. Well, Bert, you're the funniest man in the world, so I'm going to keep quiet now and just let you get funny. Well, Fred, I... Uh, uh, let's go, Bertie, old boy. Well, uh, <laughs> this is embarrassing, Fred. Uh, I don't know how to tell you. Well, you tell me what, Bert? I don't feel funny. <laughs> Bert, after that build up, you don't feel funny. Uh, yes, just one of those things, I guess. I was funny all morning. I had the chambermaid screaming around the hotel. <laughs> the two I caught. <laughs> You were funny around the... Uh... I, I was funny all afternoon. You were? That's what I can't understand, Fred. All day long, you might say, I've, I've been a pixie on the wing, a gay blade, a spontaneous pantaloon. But right now... I don't, don't feel, feel funny. funny. I heard you on Bing Crosby's program, Mr. Lar, and you were witty. I was brilliant, Portland. Remember that gag I told about the two patients meeting in Mayo's clinic? <laughs> the first patient says... The, oh, this will kill you. <laughs> the first patient says, I'm aching from neuritis. And the second patient says, <laughs> I'm Mandelbaum from Chicago. <laughs> yeah, I was a rowdy that night. <laughs> I was in the groove with Crosby. You know, with Crosby, I was another man. Oh. And could we use the other man right now? <laughs> I can't understand why you can be funny with Crosby and with me, nothing... Well, I, I don't know, Fred. I, I I think I like to work with Bing. He he gives me something. Well, I'm giving you something. <laughs> yeah, but with Bing it was money. <laughs> Charlie, do you remember Oscar Levant? Remember him? I took insult lessons from Oscar Levant. <laughs> well, one day Oscar surprised Fred with his affability. Hello, Fred, old boy. <laughs> Fred, I've never seen you looking so well. Oscar, you stooping to flattery? Whatever has come over you? I don't know. Suddenly I'm a nice guy. It's terrible. How can I become my old repulsive self again? <laughs> you mean you were happier as a rat? Yes. <laughs> Well, Oscar, you have got to get hold of yourself. Why should I get hold of myself? I might get to like it and become an osteopath. <laughs> well, when did your personality reverse itself, Oscar? It started out in Hollywood, Fred. Well, tell me, what were you doing out in Hollywood? For my birthday, somebody gave me a pair of smoke glasses and some lavender wedgies. <laughs> Where else could I wear them without people staring at me? <laughs> Well, didn't you make a picture with Joan Crawford and John Garfield for the Warner Brothers? Yes. I suppose you uh, play the piano in the picture. Whenever they send for me to come out to Hollywood, it always has something to do with the piano. Well, how do you mean? If it's a B picture, they want me to play the piano. Yeah? If it's an A picture, they want me to move the piano. <laughs> well, what about this picture you just finished? In this picture, I play the piano and move it. <laughs> Well, tell me, how did you, uh, how, how did you photograph? I'm hideous. <laughs> I 
I should wear a sweater over my face. Say, if you had pop eyes, a sweater might look good. <laughs> Remember Dottie Mahoney? Her real name was Shirley Booth. Yeah, and she was cute. Not couth, but cute. <laughs> Poor Dottie wanted to be a singer in the worst way. And Fred let her do it. Well, Miss Mahoney, now about my musical, are you uh, familiar with the Mikado? Please, let's not indulge in no Oriental insinuendos. No, no, I mean, I mean the operetta. My Mikado is about New York City. It's called Manhattan Mikado. Here's your part. The opening scene is the Greyhound bus terminal. You and I are two tourists from Amarillo, Texas. Now, as the bus pulls in, we're greeted by Grover Whalen and the head waiter from Lindy's. Grover Whalen and the head waiter from Lindy's? Grover gives us the keys to the city, and the head waiter from Lindy's gives us the locks. Oh, yeah. I get it. A wandering tourist, I just one of a million yokels, squinting through my bifocals, seeing New York where I die. I've seen the Rainbow Room, Central Park, in all its beauty. I shook hands with Howdy Doody. I've even seen Salt Bloom. I've seen everything but General Grant in his tomb. That was, uh... What do you think of my opera so far, Miss Mahoney? Well, it ain't no Rigoletto. But neither is Carmen. No, that's true. Uh, what happens next? You sing. Oh. To me, New York don't mean a thing. Tra-la, to me, it does nothing at all. New York has no grass, no trees. Tra-la, kids don't know the birds from the bees. Tra-la, and apartments are terribly small. You can hardly squeeze in them at all. The streets are all filthy. The air's full of smoke. Everyone gyps you. The divorce was a joke. New York's all right to visit. It's all right, but is it? To me, New York don't mean a thing. New York's all right to visit. It's all right, but is it? New York don't mean after this song, after this song, we decide to leave New York and go back home to Texas. At the bus station, I go up to the ticket window and say, two tickets to Texas. The girl says, where in Texas? And then we sing... We're leaving, We're leaving New York for the, for the town, town we love best. Amarillo, Amarillo, Amarillo. The town we love best is the best in the West. Amarillo, Amarillo, Amarillo. Where a boy is a boy and a girl is a girl. Where an oil well gives oil, it doesn't give oil. No television and no Milton Berle. Amarillo, Amarillo, Amarillo. Oh, do you do? Oh. Top of the morning to you, Mr. Cassidy. Oh, and the rest of the day to yourself, you dear Irish Colleen. Will you not do me the honor of stepping into me humble abode for a cup of coffee? I'd love to. Instant chase in Sanborn, of course. Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> I've just had 14 and a half gallons. Of it. 14 and a... You always drink that much coffee, Mr. Cassidy? Only the morning after I've been to awake, me dear. <laughs> Well, that's the time for the heftier coffee. New Instant Chase and Sanborn. It's a new blend, you know. A heftier blend of the world's richest coffee beans for extra flavor and aroma. Oh, ho. Uh, Mr. Cassidy, how did you get that awful black eye? Oh, that was at the wake. You see, me friend Houlihan and I were having a friendly little discussion. And one word led to another. And you know... I found him a lot like New Instant Chase and Sanborn. Really? How's that? He's heftier. <laughs> 
Fred was the kind of a comedian that made other comedians laugh. Uh, they say that about you, too, Bergen. Oh, who, Charlie? Well, I heard Milton Burrow say, when I hear the way Bergen tells a joke, it makes me laugh. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of Burrow, did you know that Fred once almost did a radio show with Milton Burrow? Fred, next Tuesday night, I'm starting my new program. Today, the sponsor called me up and said he wants a singer on the program. A singer? Singers are a dime a dozen. But this singer must sing like Rudy Valley. Oh. And I've got to find another Rudy Valley. Milton, frankly, do you think the world is ready for another Rudy Valley? <laughs> Fred, please. You know, I'm desperate. My sponsor is a Yale man, and unless I get a guy from Yale who sings like Rudy, the deal is off. Well, look, Milton... There's just one man, Fred. You. Me? Fred, you're the only other man in radio who can sing through his nose. <laughs> but, Milton... Fred, you can out-sing Rudy with one nostril tied behind your back. <laughs> but, Milton, well, honestly, I'd like to help you, old boy. But after all, I didn't go to Yale. Fred, who'll know the difference? You're from Boston. Let me hear you sing like Rudy. My time is your time. Oh, great, my Fred, great, great, great. What tone, what resonance How do you do it? Well, it's my left sinus It has a slight echo in it no. <laughs> The minute my sponsor, Mr. Badoo, hears you I'm all set This is his office here Okay, let's go in Yes, yes, who is it? Mr. Badoo, your worries are over Here, sir, is our man Who is this? Hi-ho, everybody <laughs> Chad Bull, you're a wonder worker Oh, wait till you hear him sing, Mr. Badoo Go ahead, friend My time is your time, your time. Dad, he's uncanny. Time. Just, just like Rudy, eh, Mr. Badoo? Like him, boy. Once we stitch his eyelids down, no one will know the difference. <laughs> if you go to Yale... Did he well, go to Yale? Uh, <laughs> Fred, let me talk. Give him, uh, Fred. Fred, uh, give him the old campus song. Bula. Bula? Well, he only went one year. <laughs> Quick, Fred, the Yale Whiff and Poof song. Okay. We're poor little lambs who have lost our way. <laughs> Mr. Badoo. I'm sorry I cracked, old man. Alan, will you join me as we stand in silence for one minute facing New Haven? <laughs> Let me clasp your hands, sir. Tubby Badoo, Yale, class of 87. Bunky Allen, Yale, 98. Milty Burl, Grossinger's, 43. <laughs> Fred's next guest is Beatrice Lilly, Lady Peel. Oh, a strip artist. <laughs> Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein thought so much of Beatrice Lilly and Fred Allen that they gave them exclusive permission to do a parody of that great musical, Oklahoma, while it was the biggest hit on Broadway. Miss Lily, why don't you come on my program tonight and I can show you how we work it here. Oh, sorry, Fred. I'm much too busy. I'm here looking for material for a new review I'm doing in London next month. B, if you would be interested in a smash musical show for London, your search is over. Oh, do you have a show? Well, what's it called? Piccadilly. Piccadilly? What does the play about? The scene is Piccadilly Circus. <laughs> Billy in the land of shilling, pence and pounds. Where a cop, a bobby, something smart, is knobby and the subway is called the underground. And when we Don't play... Play, play... Stop the music, now, please. Stop just singing, really. B, B, is something wrong? Yes, this music's from Oklahoma. Now, <laughs> look, uh, B... I can't star in a black market play. Well, look, the rest of the show is entirely different, B. Now, listen to this next scene. Well, what is it? Well, you are Daisy. You're a treacle girl in a pudding shop. A treacle girl? You're a young, innocent girl. I see. I'm good, but I'm sticky. <laughs> right. Now, as this next scene opens, you sing... There are days that I feel I should chuck it When the rain's coming down by the bucket It's a nice day for ships the sky drips and drips. I'm here in a puddle, clear up to my hips. Oh, what an infamous morning. Oh, what a typical day. The streets full of flotsam and jetsam, and everything's coming my way. Oh, what a frightfully lousy day. <laughs> That 
was wonderful, B. What's next, Fred? Well, now comes the love scene. I am your sweetheart, Herbert. We're sitting on a park bench, and you speak. Herbert, ain't this heavenly? Daisy, I've got a question to pop. <laughs> Birds. But Daisy. You touched my hand. But I had me mitten on. <laughs> Remember the rules of English courtship, Herbert? Don't bone my kipper for me. Don't slap my bicycle clips. Don't put salt on my fish and chips. A people will say we're enamored. Don't tug my tea bag string. <laughs> Don't filch my crumpet crumbs. Don't sniff my chrysanthemums. <laughs> the neighbors will say we're infatuated. I right. think that's good. Don't jostle my snooker cue. Herbert, please don't get gay. Darcy, I won't even look at you. The hoi polloi will sigh where that was. Say, if I rehearse a little more, this play will be a sensation in London, B. <laughs> Now, the next scene is the big climax. Well, tell me, what happened? Well, your father refuses to let us marry. As the scene opens, you are pleading. You say... I have an art painter. Herbert's renting a Norse. He's going with the Northwest Mounties. But... <laughs> but, Canada, Daisy, it's too blasted cold. The temperature goes down to ten beneath the cipher. Freezing. <laughs> Freezing weather won't bother me none, sir. For the cold, I don't give a newt Cause I'm wearing my new union suit Yes, I'm wearing my new union suit With the hinge on the back <laughs> The cloth pure wool and the buttons are brown The seams sure hold it together The arms roll up and the legs roll down In case there's a change in the wear it's me itchy little suit with the hinge on the back <laughs> well there you are B. in the big finale we are on the queen elizabeth about to sail for canada as the boat pulls out we hear the merry villagers singing <laughs> Caroline, have you met my good neighbor in Allen's Alley? Don't tell me it's Mrs. Newsbaum. You was expecting maybe Juanita Valdez. <laughs> Mrs. Newsbaum, I wanted to discuss instant Chase and Sanborn coffee with you. What discuss? It's delicious. Have you tried it lately? Lately, early for lunch. This is how I got mine, Pierre. Oh, Pierre's a coffee lover? A lover he's not. <laughs> but coffee he's crazy about. He remembers chasing Sanborn and the dated bag. How's that? A date he had didn't serve him chasing Sanborn coffee. Her he didn't bag, he can. <laughs> really? Positively. But me, personally, by giving him delicious chasing Sanborn coffee, I'm grabbing Pierre on the rebounce. Oh, Mrs. Newsbaum, you and Pierre must love our new heftier instant Chase and Sanborn. It's a blend of the world's richest coffee beans. Extra flavor, extra aroma. Makes it heftier. You think Chase and Sanborn is heftier? You should see my Pierre. <laughs> On his 30th anniversary in show business, Major Bowes paid this tribute to Fred. Fred Allen, at the end of 30 years, I've never heard you say an unkind thing or give utterance to an unpleasant thought. Benny was born ignorant, and he's been losing ground ever since. <laughs> Benny was doing a monologue with a pig on the stage. The pig was there to 
eat up the stuff the audience threw at Benny. <laughs> Why, some weeks he used two pigs. <laughs> Benny is the only guy in New York who has to bounce his nickels for the manager before they let him in the automat. Then one day they found a stowaway in a sightseeing tour of Radio City. Who would be low enough to sneak into a tour to save 60 cents? There's the guy! Hey, you! Who, me? Jack, how can you be so cheap? All right, go ahead. Be like the other radio comedians. Tell some cheap joke. I won't even eat in the sun. My shadow might ask me for a bite. <laughs> Your shadow has teeth? <laughs> Jack, now look. <laughs> Jack, don't get excited. Look, if you're cheap, you're cheap. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> Well, Jack, if there ever was a time that you and I should not argue, this is the time. What do you mean, this is the time? Well, a lot of, haven't you heard, a lot of the radio programs that have been on for many years have been canceled. By the way, you, uh, you finished tonight, didn't you? <laughs> yes, sir. Tonight was my last show of the season. Did your sponsor mention anything about your program coming uh, back in October? Well, no, no, Fred, but we have a mutual understanding. You see, we always sort of take it for granted. Oh. The season ends, the sponsor shakes hands with me, and then we... Yipe! <laughs> Jack. Jack, what's, what's wrong? Tonight he didn't shake hands. <laughs> Cheer up, Jack. When you're retired, you can tune in on my new show. New show? Uh, people don't want entertainment today. A radio show has to give away things. Nylons, iceboxes, automobiles. You mean to stay on the air, you have to give things away? Yeah. <laughs> I'll die first. <laughs> well, not me. I'm auditioning my new program tonight. And you're, Fred, you're giving things away? Tons of stuff. Well, Fred, as long as I'm here in the studio... Well, no, I'm sorry, Jack. Professional... <laughs> Professional people cannot participate. It's a rule. But uh, don't you ever find people on these programs changing their names to, to get something for nothing? Well, occasionally we do catch a phony, but we're on the air. What can we do? Hmm. Uh, Mr. Allen, we're ready for your audition. I'll run along, Fred. So long. So long, Jack. Hmm. Giving away things for nothing. Well, all right. Let's try out my new show. Here he is, the man who will change one of you nobodies into king for a day. The old kingmaker himself, Red Allen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And here is our first eager contestant. Your name, sir? Myron Proudfoot. <laughs> Myron Proudfoot? You look like a chap I know. I'm not interested in your friends. Start giving things away, brother. <laughs> What is your occupation, Mr. Proudfoot? I'm a chaplain in a bakery. What does a chaplain do in a bakery? I put wings on angel cakes. <laughs> How long have you been in the cake business, Mr. Proudfoot? Long enough to know a crumb when I see one. <laughs> when I see one. Now, don't get sarcastic, Mr. Proudleg. The name is Proudfoot, and make with the question. All right. Who was the sixth president of the United States? John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams is correct, and Mr. Myron Proudfoot is king for a day. Well, Your Majesty, how do you feel? Never mind how I feel. What do I get? Immediately after this program, Your Majesty will be guest of honor at a banquet at Hamburger Heaven. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, through the courtesy of the sanitation department, you will be guest conductor on the 11-5 garbage run through the Bronx. At night, in your ermine robe, you will be whisked by bicycle to Orange, New Jersey, where you will be the judge in a chicken cleaning contest. I'm king for a day! And that's not all! There's more? Yes, we are going to start right now to make you look like a king. Your suit is a little baggy, king. Boys, take his majesty's coat off. Wait, wait, wait. On our stage, we have a Hoffman pressing machine. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. An expert operating the Hoffman pressing machine will press your trousers. Now, wait a minute! You bet I'll keep my shirt on. We're a little late, folks. Tune in now, again. Come on, Alan, week. give me my pants. Quiet, King. Alan, this is a great <laughs> Where are my pants? Benny, for 15 years I've been waiting to catch you like Alan, this. Alan, you haven't seen the end of me. It won't be long now. I want my pants. I'll do it. Caroline, my 
My neighbor in Allen's Alley, Falstaff Openshaw, thinks he knows a sure way to get women to change to instant Chase and Sanborn coffee. Oh, good. You've written a poem for us? Indubitably. <laughs> I might go so far as to say in double dubitably. Have you heard whether you up your cup righty or lefty, new Chase and Sanborn tastes good and hefty? Oh, well, thank you, Falstaff, but is that all you have, just a title? No. I have written a poem. May we hear it? Precisely why I am here. It is called Beat the Drum. You may beat the drum, you may sound the cymbal, write verses gay, read poems nimble. But save your ink and voice, why waste it? To appreciate Chase and Sanborn, just taste it. <laughs> well, maybe you're no poet laureate, but you do know new instant Chase and Sanborn coffee. And it is a heftier blend of the world's richest coffee beans. Heftier for extra flavor and extra aroma. And friends, Falstaff is so right. For the heftiest coffee yet, Chase and Sanborn's the one to get. There's one thing for sure, and I want you all to know it. If there's one thing that irks me, it's a lady poet. <laughs> Well, Charlie, wasn't it wonderful of Chase and Sanborn to bring back Fred Allen? Yes, it was. And like Chase and Sanborn, he's heftier than ever. Makes me want to read the book, you know, on how to make salad. You know, Fred Allen's lettuce? No, no. <laughs> Fred Allen's letters. Oh, is that what it was? <laughs> yeah. Now let's wish Chase and Sanborn another heftier 101 years. And same to you, Bergen. Well, thank you. Good night, everybody, and good coffee. Heftier Chase and Sanborn coffee, of course. Yeah. Good night. Better get to bed now, Bergen. I'll rub your back. You have just heard Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy bringing you the Chase and Sanborn 101st Anniversary Show presents Fred Allen, written, edited, and produced by Carol Carroll and Daniel Sutter.